evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Thank you. It's 6.01. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third Board of Health meeting in 2021. I hope we've all had a nice beginning to the week so far. A nice reminder to all to please turn off your cell phones and mute all other electronic devices to avoid distractions, please. To acknowledge attendance, I will call out names of board members I see present. Please let me know if I have left out your name. I see Dr. McMahon, Dr. Fletchman, Dr. Kent Dean, Mr. John Latch, Dr. Makasokini, I see Dr. Asadi. Am I missing any board member? Am I missing anyone? At this point, can I please call on others present? I see Dr. Momodu. Can I please call on others present at this meeting to please briefly introduce themselves? Uh, Jennifer Green, Health Department Director. Hello, Dr. Green. Katie York, Accountant for the Health Department. Hi, Ms. York. Lori Hager, Medical Director, Health Department. Ashley Curtis, Deputy Health Director. Thank you. You are welcome. Anyone else? Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend this meeting. Can we pause, please, for a moment of silence to relax and unwind and bring awareness to the present? Thank you very much. Please take a look at the agenda for today's meeting. There has been a change and addition to the action items. So we have four action items instead of three. And that is the addition of approval of the proposed 2020 budget. May I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? So moved. Second. I second. Second. Approve the agenda. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also, have we all had the opportunity to go through the last minute meeting from the last from February on pages through to four? If so, do we have any comments, corrections to be made? If there's no correction or corrections, may I have a motion to approve, please? Motion to approve. First. Thank you. Second. Aye. Mamadou. Thank you, Dr. Mamadou. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Next on the action item is the approval of the Health Department Strategic Plan as on page 5 through 23. Can I please call on Ms. Ashley Cottis to present the Health Department Strategic Action Plan for 2021-2022? Please, Ms. Good evening, everyone. Um, on page 5 uh, to 23 of your packet, you'll see our 2021-2022 strategic plan. This is based on the priorities that you all created in February of 2020. Um, three internal priorities and four external priorities. This strategic plan has gone through um, all of the steps to, be, to meet the accreditation standards. Um, briefly, I'll go over the content, but I don't wanna have to read for you um, 
We have an introduction of what a strategic plan is on page three and four, um, which includes um, the contributors, which is our strategic planning team at the health department, as well as you all and our senior leadership team. Um, we go a little bit into the core function of public health and the 10 essential public health services on the next few pages, um, moving into our mission, vision, and values, which align with pride, which is the county um, standards. Um, we do a brief uh, section about the linkage to our community health assessment, which happens every three years, and we're actually in the middle of a community health assessment year. And Dr. Green will discuss that with you later on um, in this meeting. Uh, we talk a little bit about our quality improvement plan, which is also in development. Um, we go over a summary of the strategic planning process in the next couple of pages um, and what we did to get here to this point um, for your approval. Um, we go over right there with the chart for um, how we go about planning, um, what we're gonna do each step of the way. Um, we list out the Board of Health priorities in the strategic plan, as well as the goals and objectives that came from the Board of Health priorities. Um, and then we go briefly into implementation and tracking uh, what we're gonna be doing over the next couple of years to ensure that these goals and objectives are met. Um, lastly, there's an appendix that goes into all of the different planning documentations and worksheets that we use throughout the year to ensure that this is a quality strategic plan. I'll stop and um, answer any questions if you have them. And I'll just add one additional piece. So this, um, after we will um, make it look pretty, so we will have a public facing document that will go on the website, so our PIO department will um, you know, fix all the margins and put the links back in in the right places, and then we'll have a public-facing version that will go on our website once it's through um, and run through our PIO office. Thank you. Any questions, any comments, please? Can I have the motion to approve the action plan, please? I make a motion to approve. Second. Second. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Can I please call on Ms. Candy York to present the proposed 2020 budget? Mrs. Candy York, please. Yes, ma'am. We're going to set up a presentation. Take just one moment. And you get your head set. The first slide here is a message from the health director. And since this wasn't sent out in advance, I will read the message. It states that Cumberland County Department of Public Health is committed to our mission to provide high quality service in a professional, efficient, and physically responsible manner while improving the health of Cumberland County. Our mission is to have healthy people living in a healthy community. Our aim is to improve the health of our citizens offering health education and preventative services. Public health staff identify key community health issues and health hazards, as well as enforces laws and regulations to ensure safety. I am pleased to present for your consideration the fiscal year 2022 budget request. The budget represents revenue and expenditure projections to support public health programs and services. The total budget is in support of continuing operations for 30 programs and administration. The budget also supports ongoing efforts to address the COVID-19 pandemic in Cumberland County. Expenditures are estimated based on prior trends and known increases to retirement benefit contributions and operating expenses. 
Revenues are projected with actual state allocations and grants received, as well as Medicaid and fee revenue estimations. The recurring budget request for fiscal year 2022 is $21,211,272, which represents a 0.5% decrease from the current year's budget of $21,311,396. On your approval, this budget request will be presented to the county manager for recommendation to the Board of County Commission. Thank you for your consideration. It's signed sincerely, Dr. Jennifer Green. Next slide. The first slide here represents the revenue projection. It will show in column one the actual fiscal year 2019 revenue collections. The second column is your fiscal year 2020 actual revenue collections by category. Hello. Followed by the adopted budget for fiscal year 2021. And then the year end projection for fiscal year 2021, which you see is you stated at $20,595,084. And then we're requesting for fiscal year 2022, $21,211,272. And each one of these is um, represented by category. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you have about any of the categories. But I will point out two variances. For state and federal dollars, you'll see that there is a 6% um, increase represented. This is due to an allocation for the regional support teams, which is a COVID-related project. And it, in, it allows for on-site infection control prevention training to long-term care facilities in the region that we have been assigned by the state. In grants, you will actually see that there is also a 6% increase represented in fiscal year 2023 budget. That is due to a grant from the healthiest cities and counties. That grant, that grant addresses local barriers to healthy food access. And also we receive an additional grant from the Partnership for Children, which will um, hire a nurse consultant to work with the daycares in Cumberland County to improve the quality of health and safety services at daycare. The next slide is the projected expenditures. Again, is representing the actual expenses for FY 2019 and 2020. Third column shows our adopted budget for fiscal year 2021. And then what our projection is for the end of the year of 2021 at $20,595,084. And there again, our request, $21,211,272. And it's broken down by this category. Um, I put all the clinical services for all of our operations for each department together and then separated out some of the other components that are not clinical. School health, WIC, environmental health, and the care coordination, which is known, formerly known as the care coordination for children and the pregnancy care management program, which does have new acronyms, but that's how I know you guys are familiar with it. I will point out the variances there that are in great impact. In the administration budget, you'll see that there's a 7.9% decrease in operations for FY 2022. That is due, we're actually budgeting the actual cost, a recurring um, cost of the new electronic record system, health record system. Um, and this year, 2021, we were unsure of which direction we would be going and which company we actually would select. And so we had um, allowed for most expensive possible scenario there. And so this year we have an estimate for actual costs that reduce that category. In the care coordination, you'll see a decrease of 5.5%. That is due to we did a reclassification of free nurse physicians to social workers. As part of, as part of the state agreement, we have to have um, both disciplines of nurses and social workers within, within that program. And due to the actual allocation of that program, it was more feasible to actually have social workers 
that nurses to reduce the cost of savings in the compounds of allocation. The next slide is this uh, chart just to um, show you a breakdown of the revenue. That category sometimes it's easier to see it in a visual. I'll point out the, um, the most important thing there to me is to remind you that we do receive 46% of our funding from the county. And then, of course, all the other categories represented are listed. The next slide is expenditures. And there again, I just break it down by the different categories. Well, 42% of our budget being for clinical services, and only 15% for administration. And then the other components as well. The next slide is showing the fund balance that we are requesting to appropriate for FY 2022. The first column is showing you our beginning balance and fund balance. Assigned to the health department is four million seven hundred twenty-eight thousand three hundred sixty-one dollars. I'm projecting at the end of FY 2021 that we will still have four million six hundred sixteen thousand seventy-six dollars in assigned to the health department, and we're requesting to appropriate four hundred ninety-eight thousand three hundred sixty-three dollars in FY 2022. Two hundred sixty-five thousand two hundred forty-eight dollars of that is to the debt service for our building. And it's paid for by the Child Health, Family Plan, and Maternal Health Program. And then the remaining 233115 is to actually hire temporary case managers and the CC for some care coordination for children in the Great Care Management Program. And that's a continuation. We've been doing that for a couple of years. So that's not a new audience. Um, All right, this slide here represents the new positions that we are actually requesting the county to grant us. The department um, submitted and requested in the first column 18 total new positions, and I have them listed by department. So for environmental health, they requested five new environmental health specialists and one process and assistant four. Epidemiology requested a part-time public health nurse. In administration, we requested an additional housekeeper. Health education requested public health educator two and one. And then in school health program, they requested a public health nurse three for us and team lead. And then, I'm sorry, two of those. And then six public health nurse two part time 35 hour week position. After reviewing the request, um, and it was submitted through the process, we decided to move forward with requesting the county to grant us two new environmental health specialists, which will improve the timeliness of state required inspection, and then one team lead for school health program, and two of the 35 hour a week school health nurses. That is in a goal to reach the national goal of one nurse to every 750 students in Cumberland County. Our current ratio is one nurse to every 1,413 students. If we receive the additional nurses, it will reduce down to one nurse to every 1,338 students. The next slide, this is represents um, new position called operating expenses. So if we would be granted the new positions we were requesting, these are the expenses related to that. They want a new laptop, they will receive a cell phone stipend because they are out in the field, um, do not have office phones. Travel and training expenses. Um, a lot of that travel is going to be geared around your environmental health specialists because they are actually going all over the county doing this section. And then, of course, some supply. So that total is $15,720. Okay. I went ahead and included, and included the proposed fee schedule changes. Um, this was previously approved at the Board of Health meeting last month on February 16th. I'll just remind you that there's no changes to the clinical fee schedule, no changes to our medical record copy fees, and then no changes to the existing environmental health fee schedule, except we want to add a new fee for the well driller callback fee of $75. And then finally, this is your total budget request. 
tax return is the $21,211,270. The supplemental request for the new positions and their operating expenses is $317,184. Bringing our total budget request to be submitted to the county of $21,528,456. I can answer any questions you may have about any of the visitors. I, I had a, I had a question. Sorry, Dr. Ojo. Um, to Candy, um, about the electronic health record, I didn't quite follow the accounting on that. Can you explain that to me one more time? What's the fee for that, or how's that working? Yes, sir. So um, when we did the budget for last year, we weren't sure because we had not made a selection. We were still in the process. Um, so given um, the amount that uh, between a collaboration of finance and county IS to determine how much that expense would be, uh, we just budgeted an arbitrary amount last year. This year, though, since the collection had been made, it, they were able, IS was able to provide me with an actual expense of what our cost would be in fiscal year 2022 for the actual license and monthly maintenance fees and things of that nature. And and what's the monthly maintenance fee? Um, well, everything together is our rent to the ballpark of fifty-five thousand dollars. Fifty-five thousand dollars a month? No, no, no. That's for the year. Oh, okay. All right. Just which is a, to, yeah. yeah, which is a lot less than what we budgeted in FY twenty twenty-one. Thank you. Okay, uh, Candy, I have a question as well. In reference to the nurse uh, student ratio, has that remained static of the same or has there been any improvements? How has it been trending? Um, well, last year we were also granted um, additional nurses. And unfortunately, I didn't bring the information with me from last year's meeting to tell you, but I can send that out to you what it, that it did improve. So. Um, this year, it did improve to the one nurse, so every 1,413 students. And in fiscal year 2020, it was it was more than that. Um, I can't remember the exact number, but I can definitely provide that to you. Uh, because in light of the um, COVID and the impact that it's having on the school system, I just wondered, in reference to trending, are we trending in an improved direction or staying basically the same? Um, well, it, it's, it's improving. Um, like I said, it improved this year with the additional four nurses that we gained this year. And then in addition to that, if we would gain these additional three nurses. It's going to improve um, and then reduce it down, not quite 100, um, but getting closer, you know, a little bit, little bit closer to the one, the 1 to 750 ratio. So every additional nurse... Yeah, because the student population, when I look at that, it's staying pretty, it's pretty you know, consistent. So we haven't had a big influx of students in the past couple of years. So, so with additional nurses, it has shown improvement that ratio. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. York. What does the acronym PMP, PMPM stands for? I'm sorry. That's per member per month. So that is Medicaid enrollees and those two programs. And so we have a capitated amount that we receive to provide service to those um, clients each month. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments, please? Thank you, Dr. Green, for that health director's message. And thank you, Mrs. York. May I please have the motion to approve the 2022 budget, please? The proposed budget, please? I motion to approve it. This is and I move that we approve it. Thank you. Second? I second the approval. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Let's move on to item three on the agenda. The floor is now open to for public comments, please. 
I don't have a, I don't know that we have any pub, registered public comments, but I want to um, remind folks that we, as Kelly mentioned in her reminder email, the meetings are being streamed live on uh, CCNC TV, which is Spectrum Channel 5. So that started last month and is going to continue forward. So these uh, Board of Health meetings are streamed live and then they're archived on YouTube. Um, so uh, just for your knowledge and reminder. Thank you. We will close the floor at this time for public comment and call on Mrs. Candy York again to please present the financial reports. Mrs. Candy York. Yeah. On page 24 of your packet, begins your monthly financial reports. The closing of the month, February 28, 2021. At the close of the month, our revenues exceeded our expenditures by $477,349.36. On page 25 is your expenditure report by program. Through the close of February 28, 2021, we have expended 53.17% of our budgeted expenditures. On page 26, we collect our revenue collections by account. First listed is your state and federal allocation, followed by our grant. Page 27 represents our Medicaid collection. And then I will draw your attention to, you can see the comparison between FY21 and fiscal year 20. We have um, recognized additional Medicaid dollars. I just want to let you know this is due to some of the COVID testing that we completed and that COVID testing. We did um, ask uh, patients if we were allowed to build our insurance. And of course, those that had Medicaid were automatically allowed to build. So we did have some increased revenue in that category. And uh, where it says escrow, North Carolina TV slash EPI, which is epidemiology. In addition, um, four rows down, you've got Carolina Ac Access Cap, which is a capitated um, payment. Also, we receive for all the Medicaid enrollees that we have in our programs for child health and even adults. Um, they actually increased the per member per month amount they were given us. For those enrollees, which of course increased the amount we received this year, and it was increased more than what I budgeted, and that was due to COVID. And then, in addition, they've actually increased our um, per member per month for our case management fees, which is our pregnancy care management and care coordination children program, which also is the reason for the, the uptick in that amount that revenue collection. The next category is our fees. And then if we're followed at the bottom by our fund balance has been appropriated and county funds. On page 28, you have your accounts receivable report by program and by payer source. And then finally on page 29 is the self-pay accounts receivable. It's listed by program and then the aging category. And I'll answer any questions about any of those reports. Thank you, Mrs. York. Any comments, any questions, please? Thank you. May I please call on Dr. Jennifer Green to present the director's report? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we, I also have a slide presentation, so we're getting that pulled up. So perfect. Thank you, Danny. Uh, so on the next slide, um, we'll start with a accreditation and um, a community health assessment update. So in your packet, you have an updated letter from February from the accreditation board to the local health directors, and in. Um, as mentioned at our last accredited or our last board of health meeting, the health directors convened and moved to approve some changes to the accreditation schedule, which then went forth to the board accreditation board. So this letter outlines the results of the uh, what they approved and did not approve. So the accreditation board granted 
a 12 month an extension for accreditation because local health departments of course are on the front line of COVID. Um, our initial 12 month extension was last year and now we are granting an additional 12 month extension um, for a total of two year extension on our accreditation, um, um, some of our accreditation requirements. But I'll give a little caveat about that in a moment. So now our head side will be due in November 2021 instead of 2020. Or I'm sorry, in November, uh, what year is this? I'm sorry, <laughs> November 2022, and our set will be delayed as well. So everything is pushed back an additional year. Um, that does not cause our accreditation requirements. So we still have to meet all of the metrics and all of the benchmarks that are laid out in the accreditation manual. It just delays our, um, what we have to present and show documentation, but we still have to meet all of those requirements. Um, in addition, they passed uh, and modified the enforcement of the community health assessment. So it aligns with the ending of the state of emergency or 60 days after the end of the state of emergency. So it doesn't, um, again, tell us that we don't have to do a community health assessment. It just delays the enforcement of the community health assessment so that if we needed additional time to complete that because of vaccine rollout, we could um, pass that time. Um, but I'll give an update on that next. And they did not vote to modify the enforcement of our state of the county health report. report. So that's our SOC. And you'll hear us, um, we usually typically give the the SOC update each year in the spring. Um, so because they allowed for a briefer version of our SOC this year, um, that did not get delayed. Um, they gave us instead sort of a template that we can use um, with a, uh, instead of a, a multi-page report this year, they allowed us to do a one-pager report that updates the work of our CHA and our CHIP, our community health improvement plans, um, in, a, in a format that is much more manageable and digestible. So we've actually already completed that and met that accreditation requirement. We are finalizing the public-facing version of that, and then if that will also go on our website to help us meet that accreditation requirement. So. Um, I think that gives us a little bit of breathing room so that we can make sure that we're focusing on vaccine rollout. But again, it doesn't cause any of our uh, accreditation program requirements. We still have to meet those. It just um, delays our turning in of that, those documents as well. Um, so in the next slide, I'll give a, a brief update about our regional community health assessment. So we are participating in the regional trial again this year. Um, it has, as uh, Ashley mentioned, time for us to um, do our next CHA, our community is B for one. So this is the timeline um, that we have laid out. Um, and our, our primary and secondary data collection is going to happen over um, the this, uh, this summer. So from June to August, we'll start with our secondary data um, collection or our secondary data collection, and then we'll make sure that is completed by particularly um, that, that primary data is completed by June. Um, in addition, right now we're getting secondary data from the state. That's coming this month and next month we'll be getting um, our secondary data report. And then later this month and into May, we are actually going to be rolling out the top. So it's, again, it's a, it's a regional survey. So it'll be consistent with others that are in our region um, and we'll be able to get input and see those finalized questions here in the next couple of weeks, and then we'll roll that out. Our goal is that we have at least a thousand surveys uh, collected. So when that um, survey is available, we'll push that out on Facebook and social media, um, on our website, and um, for our board of health members to help us to distribute that information and be able to push that out and get as many community members as possible and to make sure that our sample that we collect is as representative of our community as possible. Um, and then once we hit mid-September, we will be ready to do the secondary uh, data will be ready to share by mid-September. And then um, we will be able to share that with uh, stakeholders in October, November timeframe. And then the report will be finalized sometime in early 2022. 
I'll note that, of course, this is all contingent upon COVID and um, timelines and vaccine rollout. So things may shift to the right or to the left a little bit, but this is a little bit about where we are right now. So um, on the previous slide, we talked about the delay and enforcement of our trial. In Cumberland County, we are not um, delaying it till after the state of emergency. We are moving forward with our regional health assessment, um, but it may be just a little bit slower than what we normally do. In addition, we will be doing some focus groups, but we're likely, because of COVID and gathering, not going to do as many. Um, and that will allow us to still do focus groups, but um, and make sure that those are also um, getting, getting good information from them, but uh, perhaps not as many as we did in previous years. Uh, so next I'll provide an update on COVID. So this is our, you've seen this version of our chart before, month after month. So I feel like we are finally getting some good news on the horizon and that we have seen some consistent declines. So in the last seven days, we've had 356 cases, which is uh, less than the number of cases we've seen in the last 14 days. The chart on the right shows the number of cases over, over the course of the pandemic. So you can see that we really peaked in early January, um, right after leading up after some holiday surges, and then we started to decline in Feb January, February timeframe. So we've seen several week over week decline, so that is a positive thing. Our case positivity rate has been uh, decreasing. We're down to 6.4%. We'd like to see that closer to 5%, but so far in the last couple of weeks, um, it has been de consistently declining. Our hospitalizations have been declining as well. Um, and we have a total of 284 deaths in our community. On the next slide, uh, we will see the county alert system. So this is North Carolina's alert system that they developed based on a couple of key metrics, our cases per capita, our hospitalization data, and then in addition, um, our case positivity rate. So we are in the orange, um, and this is a, a big improvement from where we were just a month ago when I presented this same map, we were in the red. And actually, um, this is this uh, map is updated every other week. So it's actually due for an update now. So we sh I anticipate that sometime this week we'll see another map and hopefully we'll see more progress. Um, and when they first came out with this map, most counties were in the red. So we are progressing along uh, quite nicely and I hope uh, that we will continue to see improvement. So on the next slide, um, we'll look about uh, review where we are with vaccination. So we are still following the priority groups laid out by the state health department. This is going to change tomorrow. Uh, so we are um, vaccinating currently in groups one, two, and three. Tomorrow, a new group opens, and that is going to include uh, adults at higher risk for severe illness and then a few groups that are in congregate living, um, a few additional groups. So that group will open tomorrow, um, March the 17th. And um, uh, one addition to group one, they are now um, allowing for addition, a, an additional definition of long-term care. So for folks that receive care in their home um, from perhaps a home health provider or some other aid, that those individuals for at least 30 days, those individuals are also now included in group one. Um, in addition, in group four, uh, that includes anybody that is at risk for COVID due to their underlying health condition. And there's a long list, including diabetes, obesity, um, smoking, not vaping, um, but smoking at least 100 cigarettes a day, um, and some other um, neurological conditions with a slight difference between um, are the CDC list and the state list. The state list also includes those that have uh, developmental disorders, um, including um, those from our IDD community and those that have some other neurological conditions um, like schizophrenia or Alzheimer's. Um, that is a portion of group four. Um, in addition, I'm sorry, in addition tomorrow, those that are working in our homeless shelters and those that are homeless become eligible along with those that are incarcerated or in detention centers or in jail also become eligible tomorrow. 
on April 7th, the remainder of Group 4 open, and that will include anybody that is an essential worker that has not already been vaccinated. So you'll recall from last month, we sort of pulled out um, frontline essential workers, eight essential sector categories. The remainder of our essential workers are going to be eligible beginning on April the 7th. So um, we're rolling through nicely. Um, and then after that, um, everyone will become eligible after that last week goes on April the 7th. So on the next slide, um, we have an update about uh, locations. So currently we have nine providers that actually have vaccine. Um, we have other providers that are enrolled, um, but don't yet have vaccine in 15 different locations in Cumberland County. So the health department, um, our location at the Crown, we have both Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, Take care of the health system. They have Pfizer um, and are operating at um, Health Pavilion North and um, scaling down the rehab center that's still providing second doses there until um, for, this, for this time. Uh, Stedman Wade Health Services, Goshen Medical, um, Southern Regional Area uh, Health Education Center, Stray Hack, also has doses. We share our doses with uh, Stray Hack. Uh, um, for the last last week, so they have some doses available now as well. Um, Stedman Drug Center, Walgreens has seven um, locations in Cumberland County, and then of course the VA in Fort Bragg have doses as well. But of course, you need to be eligible in order to get services um, at the by the VA or Fort Bragg, not just open to the general public. Um, uh, North Carolina also has a vaccine finder now. So you can go on myspot.nc.gov, type in your, I mean, your zip code or your county, and then find your local uh, vaccine providers in your county and then get information about where and how to get vaccinated in your county. So that's one option for folks. Um, on the next slide uh, as a review of our schedule. So we continue to do second doses on Tuesdays only. So today is the second dose only clinic day, um, Wednesdays, our, our first and second doses, we do first doses in the, or second doses in the morning during our first appointment block, and then a second, first doses in the afternoon. Um, Fridays, we do first doses only. Uh, appointments in the morning, nine to three, and then our standby lane for those that are eligible is from three to five. And um, I think the best tech speaker in Cumberland County is if you want a really fast time, come three to five on a Friday. Um, if you're eligible, um, we have tend to have a lower uh, turnout during that time frame, so that's actually a really great time to come on um, Friday. We do, it's not just leftover doses during that standby lane, we set aside doses each time, each Friday for that particular time block, so that um, it's not just people that, for folks that miss the appointment. Um, we are doing a special Saturday clinic this Saturday, March the 20th, so this will be our third or fourth a Saturday clinic, if I remember correctly, um, and it will be by appointment only from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. So we'll have a couple of different appointment blocks, and we're going to do first doses only during that time frame. Uh, folks have the ability to schedule their own appointment now, so they can go online to do that, or they can call um, our, our, our staff to get assistance in scheduling their appointment. Um, and many thanks to the National Guard and our library staff who are helping staff that call center. Um, in addition, uh, for, uh, vaccines are free, of course, and insurance is not required. We vaccinate regardless of your insurance status, and ID is not required, and we have interpreters on site. Um, a little bit about on the next slide about our efforts to uh, reach out to the community to make sure that we are um, getting vaccine out as quickly as we can. Our public information office has produced uh, several videos with community voices talking about why they got vaccinated, why it's important for them, what they, they um, what it meant personally for them and why. So those are available on our YouTube channel. Um, in addition, um, we are working with community transportation to provide transportation assistance for those that need access to vaccinations at the ground. So every time um, they, whether you call in for your appointment or you schedule online on the form, we ask you if you need transportation assistance and then we coordinate that on the back end, so the community transportation. So we try to make it as simple as possible for the person. We check a box that says, yes, I need assistance, and then we'll contact you and follow up to make sure 
Um, you have an appointment one, but two, to coordinate you getting there, there and back. Um, for your, uh, we've also done several off-site clinics. So on Thursdays, we typically are spending that time going to some specific off-site clinics, uh, particularly for those that are long-term care facilities, targeting those that did not enroll in that uh, federal Walgreens CDS partnership of long-term care facilities, going to the detention center, vaccinating our homeless, going to group homes that serve those with intellectual disabilities. And um, so we've done quite a few of those uh, clinics over the last um, several weeks and months. In addition, uh, we continue to partner with uh, agencies across the county to set aside appointments for those that are um, those agencies that serve historically marginalized communities. So we'll we'll reach out to them and say, please um, let us know your membership that are eligible or your clients that are eligible. And um, if you share with us that list of names um, and they're eligible, we will set aside appointment slots for them to make sure that they also have access to vaccine and making it a little bit easier for them. Um, and then, of course, we at the vaccine site, um, when you get your packet of information, we also connect folks to uh, mental health resources and, and giving them information about Alliance Health and then the Hope for AC Hotline. So just a bit about our outreach efforts and we have some new things that we're trying to work on and, um, and increasing that outreach as we're seeing um, still vaccine hesitancy be very real thing. Um, the next slide, um, a little bit about our numbers and this is a little bit outdated because the state data system lags um, just a bit. So um, it, so the health department has administered 26,591 first and second doses. That does not include anything that we did on Friday or today. Um, we're, it just it lags a little bit. So um, it's a little bit outdated. Um, as of yesterday, countywide, we have vaccinated uh, 400 and across all of our vaccine providers. Um, vaccinated 44,776 residents that were at least partially vaccinated, um, whether that was uh, Pfizer, Moderna, or, or the J&J, &J. Um, and that's 13.3% of our population, and 30,000 residents have been fully vaccinated. Um, this does not include individuals that have been vaccinated by the VA or Fort Brown, so largely an undercount of those residents that have been vaccinated. Um, and this does not reflect necessarily the number of vaccines that our providers have administered because we vaccinate regardless of residency. So if you live in Moore County, but we vaccinate you, um, that's not included in that. Your, your number is not included in that 44,000. Um, your number is included in Moore County's number. 64% um, of the vaccinations in Cumberland have been to females, and just a little bit over half have been to those age 65 and up. And a few weeks ago, the state as a whole, North Carolina was number one in the country for vaccinating individuals over the age of 65. So I think that's something our community can be, and our state can be really proud of. Uh, on the next slide, we have um, a breakdown by demographics. So you can see, um, this shows a little, it's a little bit hard to see, but you'll have, we'll send these slides out to you. Um, over time, since vaccines have been rolled out, um, the bars show by each racial and ethnic group um, the, the percentages that have been uh, vaccinated. So the blue bar or the purple bar are those that are, are white, and the bar above that are those that identify as African American. In Cumberland County, about a third of our vaccines have gone into the arms of those that identify as African American. and um, those African Americans make up about 41 percent of our population. So we're we are um, faring a, a bit better than the state, but we still have some work to do to close that gap. And then on the next slide, we have information about um, vaccine is by uh, race as, or by ethnicity rather, and this shows that um, the percentages by those that identify as uh, Latino or Hispanic, and um, Again, we still have work to do. About 30% of our vaccines have gone into those that are Hispanic, and they make up um, almost 13% of our population. So some more work to do there. Um, we are, we've done a couple of collaborations with those that are identified farm workers, um, making sure that all of our materials are in English and Spanish, but we're also working on 
um, having more targeted outreach for this community. And I think that's my last slide. Oh, no. Um, we do have a quick update on Ebola. If, there's, um, if we wanted some more excitement for 2021, um, the state has just put the um, folks across the state, local health departments on alert and provided a quick update on Ebola. You may have seen headlines on the news about um, Ebola in other countries, so they wanted to make sure that we had the same information and that we were uh, updated as well. So in North Carolina, um, the, the CDC is monitoring our Ebola up, outbreaks in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo and uh, um, in other parts of Africa that are not all listed here. Um, so the State Health Department is going to monitor any travelers that come into the state, into the United States, or in particular North Carolina, that have um, that have been impacted, come from areas that have been impacted by an Ebola outbreak, and then they will notify us by a phone call if we have a traveler that's coming into our county, um, and then ask for the first one, and then after that they'll notify us using the state surveillance system APS. After that, um, our responsibility as a health department is to do the monitoring. So anybody, if we have a traveler, we'll do um, daily monitoring if that person is from a high risk, is a high risk exposure, and then we'll do weekly monitoring if that person, if a traveler is a um, is from an area with an outbreak that is not a high risk exposure. So we haven't had any of those notifications yet, but just so that you're aware. That's something that the state is monitoring, and of course the CDC is monitoring as well. And if you did have a traveling a traveler under monitoring, develop symptoms, we would refer it to that case a particular hospital for additional follow-up and assessment. Okay, I think that is actually my last one. No, nope, just kidding. Okay, one more time, one more slide. Uh, so we do have um, we talked to the board in previous months about NC Care 360. And NC Care 360 is the state uh, first statewide coordinated care network. And it is an electronic network that helps to connect individuals to needed services. It's part of Medicaid transformation. Um, we are required to use it and to implement it. So we're getting excited about it, even if it wasn't a requirement. It's a process that people will be able to come to us. Um, we will consent them. And then we will be able to screen them for social determinants of health, identify needs that they need, and then connect them to other community resources. And then the nice thing about this is we'll be able to follow up on referrals and there's a feedback loop. So oftentimes we say, well, um, you know, go down to Operation Innismark, or let me refer you to Salvation Army. But we don't know what happens to that referral, so now we'll be able to send referrals, get and figure out what happened with consent, do that referral so we can make sure that we make that connection. Um, so we'll use that to send and receive referrals. So our um, social worker position um, is working on um, developing an implementation plan, including what our workflow is going to look like for referrals, completing our enrollment application, and then um, identifying a champion in each department that's going to really take on and get excited about NC Care So. That is coming over the next couple of months and we're getting ready for implementation and um, sort of rallying the troops across the county to get involved in NC Care 360 because it's only going to be as good as um, the community makes it. So I'll pause there and see what questions you guys have. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Dr. McMahon. So kudos um, to, to you and your team. I really do commend you as far as the, I love the idea of the Saturday appointments. I, I didn't realize you guys were doing that. And then asking people if they need transportation. And then also, um, as you know, I brought up that concern last time, um, letting people know about availability with the Cumberland Alert. So kudos to, to you guys and your team. So um, a couple of questions that I had was, um, how many appointments per day do you guys have for the COVID appointments? So it varies by day, but between uh, first and second doses, um, we, we have capacity to do about 1,400 appointments a day. 1,400? Wow, yes. that's impressive. How, how many 
how many no shows do you end up having? So no shows are a challenge, um, and I Dr. Fisher can probably um, tell stories to the hospital side as well. Um, some days are higher than others. We have a lower on first on second dose day when people are just coming back. Um, but on a we've had those days where we've had we've been a twenty percent no show rate. So we tend to over we don't often have days where we do fourteen hundred in a day and we know that we know that people are not going to come so i'd say probably about 20 percent no show rate there's been days when it's been higher than that and days where it's been more than that but i found average about 20 percent so do you so are you getting in a thousand people a day um not in the previous weeks we were um this uh, the last couple of weeks we have not done done that um we'll have because of the no show rate we book we will book a 1400 um but we don't have that many people actually show up for their have the capacity to do that um, on second dose days of course second dose days is going to depend on how many people came three weeks prior four weeks prior so we don't anticipate that on second dose days we will do yeah, I, I would just add that certainly as as we've gotten further down the line of uh, the people who are getting the vaccine as far as the pressure to get vaccinated um the most the, the higher level groups group one group two group three there was a lot of motivation in those groups and, and those groups picked up but it seems we've gotten further down the the those groups are a little more ambivalent perhaps of getting fully vaccinated or don't see as much of a need um i would just i generally say so we're, we're seeing kind of the the pressure for that to drop off a little bit which is i mean the, the great news is that uh, as you heard, you know, Dr. Green say the hospitalization rates have dropped off dramatically. Uh, we dropped below 30 in our census in the health system this week, uh, which is tremendous when you consider our peak after January was up to 130 a day in the health system. Um, so we are back down to what we probably had near the end of summer last year at this point. Uh, and I really, you know, to the health department and our health system's credit, I think, um, you know, we've seen a dramatic curtailment in infection rates and, and the most vulnerable being and being hospitalized and running into fatal illnesses as much as we did earlier. Yes, I 100% uh, agree. I think after those first couple of groups, demand was very high. And over the last couple of weeks, we've seen demand drop off we'll see it kind of a buck when the governor announces a new group or a new phase or we're moving or adding people and then it kind of drops off and um some of it is we have more providers so that's a good thing people have to come to us but for sure after kind of that initial spike after a new group opens we see it drop off um and then people make appointments at the hospital and then walgreens and then and York County or Harnett County, and they make four or five appointments, and then they'll keep, you know, they can't keep all of them, so they don't cancel their appointment, so they take, you know, takes up a spot for somebody else that would want to vaccine. So we just strongly encourage people, if you're not, if, you know, you don't hurt my feelings if you don't come to the health department, but please cancel your appointment if you aren't going to come for somebody else to have that spot. Uh, Dr. Green, I, I'd like to mention, too, that uh, Clinic Pharmacy in Hope Mills is uh, uh, vaccinating people, too. They actually came to our uh, our Benary Hospital and, and uh, vaccinated the whole staff last week. So I, I know they're starting to vaccinate people at people's offices. So that was kind of nice. Do you know where they got vaccine from? Did they get it from a federal report? Um, somebody else told me that, and I haven't heard that they were a vaccine or So you know what? It, and they might be getting it from a federal policy. Yeah, I'm not sure where they got the vaccine from. I just uh, uh, went in, my wife went in to pick up some medicine, and they said we're going to be vaccinating. And uh, they came to our office and did everybody there. So that was really, really good. Perfect. Great. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Green. Now, any other questions or comments for Dr. Green on any of the updates presented? Um, this is Dr. Kearney. Uh, Dr. Green, do you all have the Johnson & Johnson, or is that something to come? Oh, sorry, I should have said that. We do not yet have Johnson & Johnson yet. Um, we, it's going to be allocated to us from the state. We're working on some special event allocations that um, we can submit through to the state to do a special event allocation that would have Johnson & Johnson, but we don't have any yet. Because okay. I was wondering, since that was a one-time uh, dose injection versus the two with the Pfizer and Moderna, if that would make any difference in folks deciding that they would want to take the vaccine. Yes, I think it will. I, um, what we are encouraging people to do, because I don't know when we're going to get Johnson & Johnson, is you should take any shot that's available to you. So if you wait... You know, if you're going to hold out for Johnson and Johnson, but it's going to take another three weeks for us to hold out to get Johnson and Johnson. By that time, we could have vaccinated you with Pfizer, and and you could have also completed your series. So, whatever vaccine is available, and we encourage people to take it. Of course, if they have some a special condition, they can consult with their healthcare provider. But whatever the vaccine that's available, they should take it. Right, I totally agree. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green. At this point, I would love to implore board members to please review the attendance roster on page 34 and communicate any discrepancies to Ms. Kelly. Do we have any comments from Board of Health members, please? Any comments, questions? This is Dr. Kearney. Not I just want to echo already been said that um, you guys are doing a great job, the Dr. Green and and um, the rest of the team there at the health department are doing a wonderful job and it's so greatly appreciated. So greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McAfee. Now, to remind that to all, please, if you have not turned in your signed attestation letter, please do so as soon as possible to Ms. Kelly. Also, let Ms. Kelly know if you are available and you are interested in attending the NALBO Symposium in Grand Rapids, Michigan. That will be August 1 through August 3. It promises to be very educative. In closing, I would like to say thank you very much for attending today's meeting. Please mark your calendar for the next Board of Health meeting on Tuesday, April 20. 2021 at 6 p.m. If there's any item that you would like to be included on the next agenda, please communicate such to us ahead of time. If there are no more comments, questions, can I please have a motion to adjourn today's meeting? I move to adjourn. Thank you. Second? A second. I'll Thank second. Well, I can. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Have a great week and be safe.